Nigeria has voted in a new president, Bola Ahmed Tinumbu, and it's safe to say that there's a new sheriff in town, and he has very specific ideas on how to tackle the economy. Some of the most controversial policies being the removal of the fuel subsidy and a unified exchange rate. In this episode, we're going to discuss some of these policies and how they affect our personal finances and some of the things that we should be thinking about in terms of what these policies mean for the everyday Nigerian. So, Chinedum, <laughs> fuel subsidy. <laughs> what are we saying, for or against? I think the question to answer is what will be the impact of whatever decision that we're taking. Um, so it's fine to read off the textbooks and say subsidy is bad or is good, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a different thing to analyze its impact on the country and everyday Nigeria. Okay? And so far, the data has shown that every time a discussion is made about subsidy, there's inflation all left dissatisfied and so I think the question is not whether it's good or bad I think the question is to make an assessment of the impact and how do they make the decision to remove it or keep it. I personally have always thought that we should remove the subsidy from Jonathan's time I thought you know it was important for us to remove it because subsidies are basically artificial constructs and to allow market forces work is always ultimately a better option than um, government um, intervention says everything that works in Nigeria. So in my own opinion, right, the things that I like, I'm not saying that the, the, these policies don't have negative effects, mm -hmm. but the things I like about these policies are the fact that they're driven by capitalist ideas. Mm -hmm. One, Nigeria historically is a place where the way most people make extreme wealth is through rent seeking and um, taking advantage of arbitrage. Mm -hmm. Arbitrage that is created by things like subsidies, where um, a few, we've created a gap in the market or, or um, an inconsistency in the market that means that a few will benefit over uh, the many, right? The government is basically saying to reduce the, um, the cost burden on the average Nigerian, if fuel is 100 Naira, I'm going to pay 60 Naira and Nigerians only have to pay 40, yeah. right? But with the normal typical Nigerian thing, when you create something like that, it means there are going to be some people who are beneficiaries of this government's um, yeah, paid things, right? Yeah. Who are then going to maybe do things like inflate numbers and say, well, producing or selling XYZ so that they're collecting money. Question, what is more important to solve? arbitrage, like you said, or improving people's lives? What's, what's the priority right now? In my opinion, for economic reasons, it's important for us to remove the fuel subsidy so that we can have long-term economic benefits, right? Because it is an artificial construct that allows a few to benefit over the many, one, right? However, in the execution of this, because Nigeria is already on the brink of um, economic that's disaster, that's the, right? That's the point. The, the, it now becomes the issue of how is it executed. What I would have liked to see with this government is to say, listen, we've just come out of eight years of of <laughs> hell and. Nigerians have suffered. So what are the things, even if we know that we have to do this hard thing that's going to make things harder for a while before they get better, what are the things that we can do to cushion this experience? What are the things that we can do to make it easier for Nigerians to cushion the hardship that is inevitably going to come from removing this subsidy? So I feel like the way that they executed it was a little bit um, haphazard mm -hmm. in that just mm -hmm. let's pull the um, the um, band-aid off and go right but maybe they should have been thinking about how do we what are the good things that we can do to help to increase incomes improve businesses so that revenue is increasing as our costs um, are increasing not that our incomes are staying the same and we're barely surviving and then now having the added bur burden of this um, fuel subsidy removal. So, so, you're, so you're right about the execution, but remember that a strategy poorly executed is as, is as bad as not even executing strategy at all, okay? Now the question is, did it have to be all of a sudden, could it have been in phases, could it have moved 25%, 25%, to 25%, 25% over a period of time so that at the end of one year, the subsidy is, is removed. Mm -hmm. And then we're seeing, okay, so if you remove 25% of the subsidy, mm -hmm. we have X number of cash reserves somewhere which has been used to do this project. Mm -hmm. 
and by the time we do 50%, we have X cash reserves to do this thing. But there's some kind of adjustment that happens that happen. over a period of time. People can't pay for transport today. People can't afford a loaf of bread. People I can't afford scared. meals. Yeah, exactly. I am scared. Like, even just doing the rough calculation, yes. as in last night, of thinking, you know what? I went from paying 16,000 naira for fuel for my car to 21,000. And that 21,000 is very likely going to go up to something like 40K. Who can afford that? And this is you who probably is, is resides on the island. Now imagine people who come from Agigi and Apaja to VI every day. Now imagine what the impact, this impact is going Let's to have Let's even talk them. about the knock-on effect that it's going to have yeah. on businesses and the prices yeah. you know, of things. We're yeah. currently on between 22 to 24%. Um, inflation. Yeah. What is that going to look like in the next 90 days, right? Like when the fact that, you know, transportation costs have increased because of this fuel yeah. um, um, subsidy removal yeah. and the prices of everything yeah. basically like skyrockets. What, where does that leave, you know, us? So, I'll give you an example. So, um, I, I was saying before the start of this show that a loaf of bread costs I went to the market and found that the loaf of bread cost 900 naira. And this is what it used to cost 900 naira before. So a minimum wage of 30,000 naira per month, somebody can buy 30 loaves of bread. So imagine that you go to work every day to earn 30 loaves of bread. That was two weeks ago. Now, when this has happened, so if bread goes to what, 1,005 and you're earning, what, 30,000, how many loaves of bread typically that's what you're working for? So at the end of the day, let's really assess the impact of policies. Not from the theoretical perspective, but really its impact on our pocket. Is it going to put more money in our pocket? Is it going to improve our lives? The answer so far has been no. We're always expecting humility from our Nigerian leaders. But what I, I'm more interested in is empathy. Empathy for the fact that this policy that you have created now, that means that um, an average person that wants to go from the mainland to the island for work back and forth is spending maybe like 2,000 naira um, a day times 21. <laughs> we're, we're literally looking at 42,000 naira every month on one, transportation. One person. For one Not person. They haven't, they haven't eaten. They haven't paid other bills. Haven't they haven't done, done anything. Yeah. The minimum wage is 30,000 naira. So if I am already spending 40K just to go to work to be able to earn a minimum wage, I'm already losing. If the opportunity cost, as in of staying at home, like makes more sense, right? So I want a government that is going to think about these things from, yes, make economic decisions, but also think about these things from an empathetic point of view to say, listen, how is the average Nigerian person going to survive? Because from the scenario that I just um, described, even if you're earning 100K in this economy, you are poor. You're poor. Well, you have five kids. <laughs> You're they poor. Like you're always going to be working like like in um in reverse. Like what is like we're hustling um, backwards. So it's important for us to start thinking. Okay, we've increased this um, hardship. What are we going to do to create um, revenue generating things for the average Nigerian? What bothers me is not a question of. Um, subsidy or not subsidy is the decision making process and the communication. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that you want to take X amount of money, save X amount of money. What are you going to use it for? When are you going to use it? What are the outcomes of what you're going mm -hmm. to use it for? You're right in that I, I hate the fact that we live, we have leaders that are not empathetic enough to our suffering. And one of the ways that I think they can ameliorate the handling of this um, false subsidy removal is by actually telling us how they're going to cost um, administrative costs in the government. Because I think that that is something that will encourage Nigerians. If Nigerians are hearing, okay, you remove false subsidy because you want to be more cost efficient and because you want to use that money to go and do things that will actually grow the economy as opposed to the money going exactly. into the pockets of a few right, wealthy, right? right? <laughs> but um. at, at the same time, right, sometimes we don't like being realistic about how broke we are. And the fact is, we are broke, kitty, broke, broke. Like, come, come, we don't have. We can argue about the reasons why we are broke, whether it's overspending on the government, um, on the government sides, and, and, and the government being unwilling to um, yeah. slash their own 
over bloated yeah. sort of like administrative yeah. costs and all of that. If we're removing blame and who is at fault and whatever, and we're actually looking at the real situation of the country or the economy. And in actual facts, we're minus 14 trillion or minus 20. Some, some reports are saying we have 25 trillion in debt. Some are saying we have 46 um, trillion in debt. Whatever trillion, we are broke. We don't, we don't guard it. <laughs> we don't, so we don't have money to pay any other, as in any other um, subsidy after that. So in that in that scenario, what do we do? So I guess the discussion now mm. becomes, what do we think that they can do to sort of ameliorate these um, policies that they are saying they are, two are things. going so to have long term economic? So, so having a remedy to deal with the consequences is one, and that's important. The most important thing is communication and commitment. Mm. I don't understand why you would tell me that I'm going to lose my purchasing power by X percentage, mm. but not tell me what the money is going to be used for, and not give me a date to say by so and so date money is going to come back into my pocket. You're not giving me any commitment. So you can't just be behaving like that. So those are two things. There has to be communication. There has to be commitment. Why are we afraid of holding our leaders accountable for, to give commitment? Why are they afraid of giving commitments? So I'm more interested in how they can ameliorate yeah. the negative effects of the impacts of these policies, right? So whether the policy is right or wrong, it's hard. Now, 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 and so why, <laughs> they, it? why in it, okay. right? Like, so how, what are the th ways that they can um, improve um, the situation? How can they help to ameliorate the situation that they have created? Um, and I, one of the ways that I think is by improving public transportation, right? So investing in more buses, things like that. Who? Cool best in buses and secondly um, on what roads <laughs> okay so so this is the thing mm. Nigeria's problem is very complicated mm. do we need more infrastructure that helps to improve connectivity as in uh, so that we can transport goods and services as in easier hell yes we do do we have enough roads no but will improving public transportation help to um, reduce the impacts of um, this um, fuel subsidy removal absolutely because if we, if there's, let's say there's a hundred people, like a hundred cars on the road in Lagos every day, right? And at 185 um, Naira, all those people can afford to go from, um, to work at five o'clock in the morning and come back as in at um, nine o'clock at night or whatever with, at that rate. It has now spiked to almost 500 Naira in Lagos, right? The fact is, it is going to become a lot more expensive for those cars to be able to stay on the road, right? And the reality is that for most people, their incomes have stayed the same. And if they cannot afford to be on the road as long, they're going to have to find um, alternative um, sources. One of the things would have to be collective movement. So instead of every, in one household, there are three cars coming out of each household every day, right? Maybe people are making decisions like, okay, now mommy and daddy have to go to work together and we drop the kids mm -hmm. on our way as opposed to one driver goes with the kids, one driver goes with mommy, one um, daddy drives himself. That's three different like fuel costs for three different cars. Maybe it's things like my housekeeper going to, She's not going to. She's not going to be going to the supermarket with the driver and um, AC anymore because we cannot. We can maybe no longer um, afford that, right? There are going to be people who are going to have to make um, alternative transportation um, arrangements. So if there's if there's a reduced number of individual cars on the road, that's more space. Yes. And we have more public transportation in terms of buses because the buses are inadequate as we speak, right? If they invest in things like credit um, facilities, loans that help transport business A, go and buy those um, um, buses like in bulk or whatever, that will help to ameliorate um, the, um, the costs. Maybe an increased number of buses will also help to um, mitigate the increase in price of transportation that fuel has cost because, caused because a, a bigger supply of transport sources means a, um, a reduced price. I'm just saying. Okay, so um, so I, I have three um, recommended solutions. So, so the appointment minister today, right? So one point is what you've mentioned, collective movement, and it has its merits and the merits. Mm -hmm. However, 
there's already some form of collective movement going on. Buses in themselves are mm -hmm. some form of collective movement. Mm -hmm. You have school kids and buses, okay? So I guess there has to be more collective movement amongst private cars. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that's an opportunity for business. Not necessarily the government, you know, giving loans and all of that, because there has to be a system around it. Mm -hmm. How will the cars be booked? How will you guarantee security and all of that? So all the tech guys and, you know, behavioral scientists, there's a lot of opportunity for them mm -hmm. there, but I don't think it's a government, a government thing. The second thing for me, in addition to that, I would say is actually food supply. Um, the, 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 this timing of this cannot have been more wrong because they're already challenging the food supply. Mm -hmm. So getting basic like beans, vegetables, rice, uh, tomatoes, peppers, there's already a lot of blockages there. We know for a fact that we lose about 60% of what we produce, okay? Simply because we don't have the right transportation system, we don't have the right packaging system. So for example, I was reading, when I was preparing for this, I was reading yesterday, and they were saying that we need about 60 million crates to be able to transport tomatoes comfortably. Guess how many we have? 300,000 raffia baskets, not even, not even crates. So you see, there's already a gap there. Um, they say we need about uh, 25,000 trucks or so to move. How many do we have? 1,500. And this 1,500, not, not 1,500 nice trucks, but we know the kind of trucks that they are that smoke all the way for when it starts to its, to, its, to its destination. So I think that's there. But I also think that we need to ask ourselves if we need to spend that much time on the road. Why do we always have to be on the road? Why can't we have more flexible working hours? What are the incentives that we're going to do to reduce people coming on the road? Because in itself, it's just so imagine Lagos, um, between the hours of six and eight, there's a lot of traffic in most places. Between the hours of four to seven, there's a lot of traffic in more places. Why do you want to throw more people on the road? Can't we explore ways of reducing the number of people on the road? So those are two things for me. So one, uh, collective movement, but in private cars, and I think that it will be more led by all them apps, behavioral scientists, because there's a whole system around it. Two and more, in fact, the second should be the first, is actually full supply. They are clear obstacles to remove in food supply. So if the basics, if the basics are supplied easily, then it helps to control price. Mm -hmm. And three is really, do we all have to be on the road? I mean, what are the things that we can do to reduce um, the need to go on the road? So I love it. I love that you said this, but you see, everything that you have said actually proves my point about how they need to be investing in transportation. So, for example, what you just said about mm. food, mm. one of the biggest things that we have is connectivity, yeah. moving um, goods and services across the country, across the city is a challenge, right? Yeah. And across the country is an even, even bigger challenge. So imagine we, we make fantastic tomatoes in the north, but getting the tomatoes from the north to um, Lagos is a huge challenge because we don't have enough um, roads, we don't have enough lorries, we don't have enough um, trucks. And one of the things that I, th I think that this government is probably going to engage in is PPPs. Yeah. And so public-private partnerships are going to be, I think, huge because that's something that they use to drive economic growth in Lagos. And I can see them um, doing it on a federal level, especially because there is no money. So if I don't have cash, eh, and maybe what I have is land, for example, right? And the private sector comes and says, okay, we can solve this transportation issue for you, right? But you, they now, the government then gives them either land as an incentive or they give, or they give them um, tax incentives to say, if you do, if you help us solve this problem, we will um, reduce your, um, your cost burden. So, because the thing is historically, Governments are not great at managing enterprises, right? They're not great at maintaining things like, like even roads and things that are public um, goods. People complain about the lucky, the, the toll gate all yeah. the time. And me, I'm one of those people that remember very, 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 very clearly when we, if you lived in Lekki Phase 1 and you worked in Ikoyi, you wanted to get to work at 8 o'clock, you literally had to be out of that Lekki Phase 1 gate by 5 a.m. in the morning, as in unless you wanted to die in traffic, as in just go like a short distance. Mm -hmm. But when they widened those roads and the fact that there was a private interest, right, that meant that um, private businesses are for profit, right? If I'm doing something for profit, I'm going to make sure that the road is 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 um is maintained. I'm going to make sure that there are there are um vehicles that can move cars out of the way when 
um, some, some, something breaks down. But if we rely on the government to solve those problems, we will fail because they don't know how to maintain things. They don't know how to run enterprise for profit. So they need to partner with private entities to make that um, efficient. Are there corruption things like um, associated with that? Of course there are, but is it ultimately a more effective system than allowing one um, government um, parastatal to take um, control like of like the entire thing? So what I would like to see is more situations where they're creating credits right for transport businesses, where we we're seeing people are like young people in tech in in distribution and whatever are seeing opportunities that they where they can create solutions that the government will pay them for right whether whether it is with tax incentives whether it is but it has to be private sector um, driven but government enabled so i like what you're saying uh well, I said, but you're actually even coming to my point. I think the issue is being able to identify the problems to solve. What I'm not comfortable with is saying the same thing we've been hearing for the past couple of years, that subsidies are the issue, remove it. Subsidies are the issue, remove it. There are specific areas, are specific things to solve. We talked about transportation, we talked about roads, we talked yeah. about food supply. And these are specific areas that we need to target. What we find, so for example, we have this uh, Lagos State initiated uh, initiative with these white and blue uh, Uber-like things, right? But at the end of the day, that is still on human transport. Why can't we do something like that for moving food from Yams from Benue to Lagos? Do you understand? Or even from the farms to the transportation location. Why can't we have this kind of system? So the issue of the gov for me, government is not sitting there just taking a one-sided approach. Identify key problem areas for us and business opportunities and say, okay, come on, for this three month period, this is our priority area, how to move tomatoes from the farm to the marketplace. Um, these are the opportunities that are available mm -hmm. there. And let us mobilize the sources towards yep. there, not just take a... a yeah, you're yeah. completely correct, because if they had actually even come in and, start, and started putting these credit um, things in place to boost transport, right? So that there would be something in motion yes. to make sure that like the prices will be um, reduced exactly. eventually. Because if there are more buses, available for people and people don't have to queue as much the price as in um, per kettle as in per entry into the bus as in reduces right and it will help to mitigate the increase in bus fare because that has happened because of the fuel um increase right but they didn't start with that it would it will it will make more sense that if going forward they start saying you know what let us Put the sugar first before the medicine, <laughs> before the medicine. Like let us, you know, um, do things that are going to boost um, business, that are going to create opportunities for revenue generation, right? Like first, before we we do the um the Yeah, market. and that's the thing, and that's why I'm saying that we should focus on the objective rather than the initiative. So if the focus on the objective is empowering people, putting money into people's pockets, making every, every, everybody have a happier life, mm. then that becomes the focus of, this, of the, of of the, the issue. Do you yeah. understand? Because, yeah, my concern is the decision-making process of mm. just coming to stand and say subsidy is bad. We all know that subsidy is bad and take, mm. boom. If, for example, there had been increased supply of food, I'm not going to be so I know so okay so fine it's just my transportation cost that goes up but I'm still able to go to the market to buy my beans my tomato my meat mm. my chicken at the same price then it's not so bad but when you leave the inefficiencies as they are but, but, and just hit it but let's but, but again if we're actually going down to the cocoa yeah. problem the reason that food supply is limited is connected to the lack of infrastructure and the lack of connectivity not and right. the lack of it is it, right. because if we can't transport things and 60 percent of what we produce is being thrown away that's a, a huge so, so um, you, that's a huge waste i'm saying that there'll be a if we had connectivity right food will not be as expensive See, I, I don't know if it's connectivity or if it's entrepreneurship um um so there are issues between the point of where the uh, products, so take for example tomato is harvested to the point of the market location, okay, that in itself is an efficiency and they don't have the right tools, so some use wheelbarrows, some use keke, mm -hmm. some use motorcycles, and if you go to villages you see all kinds of um, 
um, old transportation systems to get products there. Mm. Those are opportunities for entrepreneurship. Do you understand? Mm. For somebody to come up and design a system, you know, and go collecting tomatoes in proper crates so that the tomatoes are not spoiling. Okay, that's entrepreneurship. So for me, I don't know if it's so much about building more roads, giving more credits. I really think it's about entrepreneurship. People being able to identify the challenges at the different points of the value chain mm. and come up with solutions for it. That's yeah, what I think. But, Uber, for but example, it's chicken and egg. Uber now. hasn't. We've not built more roads because of Uber, mm. but Uber has come up with a solution that has led more people to park their cars. Do you understand? It's not more roads. No, but I completely disagree with you on that because 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 one, we definitely need connectivity. Why? One, if going f transporting my um, my beans from Benin to um, Lagos, there's one road in be um, between Ore and, and Ondo states that as in that is destroyed. So I can't actually pass like certain places, right? That affects the cost of me yeah. transporting my goods and increases the price that the customer, the consumer has to pay, mm -hmm. right? So on one hand, infrastructure definitely needs to be improved. Two, we do need more vehicles. Like you said, they need the tools. You can't be going with a broken down lorry from um, Kano to um, to Benin and think that it is going to be efficient. Obviously, if we have, if this process is more industrialized, as in, and they're they're heavier like um, vehicles that are that the security for like on the road that are on roads that actually work, <laughs> that are actually connected, that will take you from um, point A to point B without um, the stress of the bad roads as in, in between. Those things will help to improve um, the inefficiencies and ultimately the prices. Where, where I agree with you that entrepreneurship as in is important to help to drive it is that it is important for us to look at this um, thing differently because like I said, I don't think the government is equipped to manage certain types of enterprises. They should just enable it. So one of, you know when um, Badeboy was, Viva was running for um, for governor, one of the things that I loved, one of the, the, the policies that he was putting out that I loved was the thing about individuals being able to own seats on um, buses. So a group of us can come together and say, we're going to buy a bus, right? And um, each of us owns, I own five seats. So every every um, person that comes on this bus every day, I'm getting a percentage of of um, their ticket price. I'm, I'm basically saying that if the government enables tech and enables infrastructure and enables transportation businesses, right, these problems can become opportunities, right, that they don't necessarily have to put money in, but they, but they facilitate, right, that will create jobs and create improvement. Almost in the same thing. So if you look at GSM, for example, um, how many masks did the government build? None. Do you understand? The government didn't build any masks. Mm -hmm. So the government basically pointed in the direction to say, to basically created the concept of the market mm -hmm. and created the regulatory system, created, you know, give room for players to come in. Government did not build any masks. As far as I know, I might be wrong. And that's why I'm saying the same thing too. That's why I'm, it's not a question of just building more roads. It's actually building a system of pointing the direction of where entrepreneurship should solve. You're right that roads, but do we know for sure that building more roads is going to solve the problem of food supply? It might just be like crates. You can imagine, I mean, if you go to Mount Tobin and you see where they're uploading tomatoes, you begin to wonder, like a truck has just this raffia bag and just stack, 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 one or the other. Crates. You don't do you understand. You don't that's that's not you don't need a PhD to know that you need crates. Because the Nigerian way is for us to continue doing the broken the, the system going exactly. along with the system yeah. that is broken because it's the system that we're used to. So I'm saying that many of us don't even know the opportunities that are available. I know about post harvest losses because I was having a family project and I and I read about it and I was shocked. And I'm sure there are many people who are not even aware of what this thing is. So the government has to not necessarily put the money, but at first create the awareness of what the issues are and identify the opportunities and create the system. The government doesn't have to build roads. Government doesn't have to buy the crates. Government doesn't even might not even have to even fund the trucks. It just create the system where ordinary people like you and I can invest in these areas. And what is the system? The system is saying things like commercial banks, we're giving you tax incentives, go and give low um, interest loans to transportation businesses that can help us improve public transportation. I do agree. I do. 
money is not always I money. think I think I think I think that way they don't have to spend money right they've created something that's valuable for the commercial banks that can help them to reduce their costs and thus improve their bottom line but has also helped them to enable businesses that can create jobs and incomes for others yes but I say money is not always the problem we can give many instances of where the government um, so there's this entertainment loan that they gave a couple of years ago the agri loans that they've all done we've not seen the let me tell you the issue the problem there is never that the loan is a bad idea the problem there is that the execution the entrepreneurship is, that's where I'm going the execution in. of it is the problem that's where I'm going in. now if you ask about those entertainment loans or agricultural yeah. loans or whatever the question I always ask is let's point to the people the people that collected them they should come and tell us the stories of oh I got this loan the government announced this um, this loan for entertainment and I got it and I was able to produce a slate of 10 movies and this happens they should have plenty of success stories if they've actually dispersed these loans. The question is not whether um, the ethos of um, telling the government to enable these sectors as in is right. The question is how is it being implemented? Okay, so I'm saying that money is not always the problem. The issue is expertise. And there are many situations where governments, people have put money on solutions that haven't worked out. Mm -hmm. If we use the GSM model, it wasn't so much about the money, it was getting the right experts in the place, getting the right experts in the room. Okay, so we had Equinet, we had uh, MTN, eventually we had Glow and we had the Salat who came. But the point is that these are people who, or businesses who already had expertise in those areas, mm. okay? So money wasn't it. So it's easier for them to even get money because they already have the expertise. So for me, the problem is not throwing money at the solution. The problem for me is the expertise, is the entrepreneurship that is the issue, mm. and creating the market so that people are able to play in the market. So again, we're saying the same thing. We're just saying it in different ways. So what I've even suggested does not even entail the government spending in a, a, a cobble. Because what they're saying is, a, this government is definitely going to extract their their um, their pound of flesh from yeah. uh, from taxes. That's one. So yeah. corporate taxes is going to be a big one, yeah. right? Now, so if commercial banks can expect to pay more in corporate taxes, right? As in with this government, it stands to reason that if it, they're given um, opportunities to reduce that tax burden, in, so in exchange for creating extra value, they will. Now. I'm, I'm not saying the government should throw money at the problem. I'm saying that the government should create an enabling environment. And to, more to your point, what they can do is then say, let us identify what transportation businesses in Nigeria currently exist that just need a boost in mm -hmm. infrastructure. So if people are already doing it on a small scale, but an efficient scale, if we gave them a loan that helps them scale 800x what does that do for the economy what does that do in terms of creating new businesses and new jobs and new opportunities to earn that help to not just solve the um, larger problem but um what do you want to call it increase um, um people's incomes in one way or the other so i was so the point is so the point um I like I like to think I like mm -hmm. to think that you're coming over to my position. So the point is not <laughs> the point is not the removal of subsidy or not. There are bigger issues and there are lower hanging fruits to take mm -hmm. advantage yes. of. Okay, and that's the point I'm making is that there has to be some level of commitment in these things. There has to be awareness in these things. You can't. We're not we're not a bunch of uneducated people who are just sitting down waiting for the government to feed us. Mm -hmm. We are educated. We're enlightened. We are aware, we're looking for opportunities for business. And that has to be taken into consideration when you're making decisions. Mm -hmm. You can't just come with a blanket. It all yeah, exactly. Do. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So the point for me is, is and that's what I'm questioning, is the decision making process. So why you say it is good to make decisions on time, I say it is good to make good decisions on time. Mm, I agree. So again, if me, I'm coming from me, I'm, I'm we're Nigerian. Mm. I've <laughs> been born in this country and we were raised to eat problems for breakfast. If you're Nigerian, you literally do not expect as in anything to good to come from governments. So it's always from a lens of an imperfect place, right? So if I'm not even expecting you to be Jesus or to be perfect or whatever, yeah. I'm saying what is practicable right now, like given where we are, right? So let's move to to in t talking about decisiveness, mm. right, and and radical economic policies that we haven't really seen in past governments, as in in recent times, right? 
a unified exchange rate is going to be a game changer. Let's argue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Mrs. Personal Finance, I say. Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to give you two scenarios and you need to tell me which you prefer. Scenario A has official rate of 400 naira and parallel market rate at 700 naira. And scenario B has one rate at 900 naira. Which do you prefer? The one rate at 900 naira, and I'll explain. In scenario A, with the CBN dictating what the rate is at 400 naira, 400 naira is not practicable for 95% of the economy. Why? There are so many restrictions, which means that it creates arbitrage that allows a few to have a competitive advantage over the many. So bigger corporations are able to go and negotiate as in CBN rates, right? Which is fine. Now, there are also scenarios where, like I explained before, a um, person B, Femi, has a le leather factory that he wants to, uh, that he has sold CBN that he needs um, the money mm. for, right? Now, for him to be competitive, he needs CBN rates. However, he gets CBN rates of $200,000. As opposed to going to the, um, to the market and then producing as in leather and exporting it. What he then does is say, this 200,000 I've taken, 100,000 of it, first of all, I'm going to the, to the foreign exchange market and saying, you people are selling at 750, me, I got it at 400. He's making an immediate profit. We can't take away from the fact that a lot of Nigerian um, money making historically from even military is or whatever has been very rent seeking, which is people will put their capital in the places where there's arbitrage and they don't have to do that much work. My point is this, people abuse the arbitrage, right? And it messes up the economy because it means that now, um, me, I'm producing leather um, shoes, but I'm buying my own things at 700 and something naira, trying to compete with you that is buying at, um, at 400 and something naira from CBN. Let's even leave that. A unified um, exchange rate simplifies things. It means that there's no arbitrage for like a few to um, benefit from um, the others. And if we're saying the real price of um, dollar is 750 as in right now because of um, what market forces are saying, right? Then it's 750 and it doesn't change anything for people like me and you. Mm. Right, because it's 750. Is it possible that it will go from 750 to 900 for a while? That is certainly possible because the people who are benefiting from 400 naira before or buying at 400 naira have now come to come and meet us in the black market, so the demand has increased. However, the opportunities for them to continue that um, that that cycle of rent-seeking behavior, as opposed to producing real goods and services, right? stops however right look at it from the point of demand and supply so the official rate is in some way the government saying that i will supply dollars to you at x amount so in the same way for example on transportation government has its own buses mm. okay and you have the private sector buses so mm. government puts a lower price mm. at the government bus okay mm. what that does is that is a way of also maintaining it's just the price mechanism, the price control mechanism to make sure that things don't overshoot. So imagine if, for example, we didn't have the BRT buses, what will be the impact on transportation? Transportation figures will go high. So government is increasing the supply of, of buses and transportation. That is also reducing, reducing the price. Now, if you look at it that way, uh, so the leatherman that you said, right, I am not sure that he would prefer the fact to know that, okay, 5% of people can get official <coughs> rates, okay, whereas he has to get 700. The point for him is, how much am I buying dollar per unit? How much am I buying dollar per naira? That's his problem, okay? So, I, and I think that if you look at it from that perspective, it begins to question and we ask ourselves, what is the value of solving this arbitrage problem? What really is the value of it that is so, so important for us to solve? So we solve it and we clap ourselves for solving it, but what is the impact? I think that's the thing to look at. So it's not a question to say 
one is better than the other, but there has to be a thinking process to be able to arrive at the logical conclusion. Okay, so you see with the fuel subsidy um, yeah. argument and removing that arbitrage, you had more to play with there in terms of this is the impact that is going to have on the everyday person and you are completely right but you see with this unified exchange rate one i die on this line <laughs> do you know <laughs> because because the the, the the fact of the matter is we like broken nonsense that will continue because we're used to it right now my my thing is this if me and you mm. most of us in this country have had to be operating realistically with a black market rate right mm -hmm. Not having a CBN rate does not really affect us negatively. Let's start there. That's assuming that the price that it stays at seven fifty. Yes. Let's start there. Yes. Let's start with that. Okay. It stays at seven fifty, and we've removed this thing. So it means it's now the few that are not benefiting, right? Yes. Now what I'm what I'm saying that is important in terms of removing this rent seeking and um, behavior is. We need to start focusing on producing goods and services that are exportable because that is the cocoa of the matter. When Nigeria, when Nigeria goes away from saying it is only, it's oil that we produce and export, right? As in, and, and saying, you know what, we're investing in entertainment, we're investing in, in our raw materials and, and processing them so that cocoa becomes chocolate. And we too, we're getting the kind of prices as in for selling um, chocolates that the Swiss um, are getting, not just um, selling the raw materials and, and um, importing the, the, um, <laughs> the refined as a version of yeah. it. Can't you see that this is what we do with everything? With the, the idea behind we produce, we are one of the biggest oil producers as in um, in in world, but we um, import the oil that we, we consume. The, this, we have a huge supply of cocoa. We could be one of the biggest exporters as in of cocoa as in, in the world, but we could even better still be refining cocoa and making it chocolate so that that value added product gives us more exportable value. Now, my, my thing is this, all these opportunities for arbitrage only create opportunities that allow the status quo to, to, to um, continue. For example, when, um, when um, the government was saying um, treasury bills were double digits and, do and, and, and we were doing 18%, um, 19% on treasury bills, banks did not have an incentive to be giving people loans anymore. What is their core business? Their core business is banking. Their core business is giving out loans. But they had no incentive to give out loans anymore because they, were, they, they then began rent seeking. What do I mean by that? Now, if treasury bills are 18%, me, I'm collecting money from RSA and Chinedu from their deposits and I'm paying them uh, 1%. But the government is paying me 18% if I borrow them money for their infrastructure projects. Why would I then go and borrow Taufik, as in um, um, 100 million, sure. to build a factory that will build, um, that will produce um, sure. leather shoes that I can export? Why would I do that? Because Taufik can, the business, he can come and tell me story tomorrow and then I've lost my money. The business might not sell, the quality might not be great. Ex so many different risks that I have to take on. So they'll rather take that money and capitalize on it and make money as in for doing nothing. And we continue to encourage that behavior when we create these pockets of um, arbitrage. So the question is, yes, these things suck, but do we need to be creating an economy where like the, the government is creating an enabling environment for us to produce goods and services that are exportable so that eventually the balance of payments is in balance? And you see, you're right, you're right in that thinking, okay, and it's important, a lot of what you said is very important, it's important for us to, you know, produce um, goods that we can export, it's important for us to increase the value add here in Nigeria, and all those things that nicely said, and all those things are constant, and nobody's contesting that. The question for me is, what's the value of removing this rent-seeking issue? For me, it's the value. Because if at the end of the day, right, you take out the official exchange rate and dollar remains at 750, well, well and good, it's nice, really. Mm. But the question is, at what point does the dollar stop? So if dollar gets to 1,500 naira, mm. is it going to be better for us to 
I don't believe that that will happen. So I believe that I believe that less less inefficiencies will force Wait, the price down. It just so the a lot of what drives it up is is speculation. And if you cre if you remove the the opportunity for speculative behavior, it, it's the demand will come down. A lot of our FX is, is driven by speculation. That's possible. We need to check the fact that the data to be able to make a decision on that. Okay, but I just want to also say we keep in mind that it's not only Nigeria that tends to control. Um, the value of its currency. I think the second largest economy in the world actually does that, and it is China. China controls its currency. Japan controls. They control the way. China their, their also. Currencies. China also yeah. controls its its media. Yes. China also controls yes. its humans. Like so, how many? So what do we want to? What do we so want Japan to? Does, what, what do we want so to Japan emulate? What are we so emulating? Japan does that. So the point I'm yeah. making is the point I'm making. I get your point, and there's a lot of merit in what you're saying. The point I'm making is that we can't sit down and make decisions theoretically. We have to go into the specific of the fact mm -hmm. and also set thresholds. So a threshold should be that if you take out, and that analysis is to be done, you kill the official exchange rate, what's likely to be the impact on the... Uh, real exchange yes, rate. Yes, so if it's the 5%, 10%, 20% margin, then fine. But if we leave it entirely to complete market forces and it gets to 1,500, I'm not sure it's going to be better for us. I think I think it is going to eventually get to a, it, will, it will, I think it is going to start out going to a place where it goes high, but I think it's definitely going to go down. No, how to go to the but you just said here that for it to go down, we're going to have to increase value add, we're going to have to export. Is that something that we can do in the short term? I think that there are lots of quick wins that we can do. Right. Like this, do you know what what makes me right. laugh? See everything. See, okay, in Nigeria, eh, mm. I find that. Anything that is going to affect our pockets, as in immediately, somehow they know how to do it so efficiently. Case in point, COVID. Mm. Why were there so many COVID businesses that that um, that blew up? Because there were so many like um, new policies that came into place. Case in point, you travel and you have to um, fill that form and pay hundred and something dollars, as in otherwise you cannot, you'll be refused entry into um, thing. That was a huge revenue generating as a um, thing for the government, as in uh, for those businesses, and they were implemented like with the in a blink of an eye, and that thing impacted an entire health tech as a sector. Almost immediately, I'm saying that there are things in entertainment, in agriculture, in beauty that the government can invest in. Those are low-hanging fruits of things oh, that already so exist. Best, so. so, so you spoke of China. China. Well, let's not talk about China like um, intervening in their markets without talking about the other interventions that they do, like creating um, low-interest loans that are easily accessible the for their entrepreneurs. And that's the point, and that's the point, and that's the point. So we've taken, we've taken one part. In fact, if we open the box of cookies and we're taking one piece out. It's a whole bouquet, it's a whole basket, it's a whole basket of tomatoes, it's a whole bouquet of flowers, it's a whole pack of biscuits to take. There are them things you put together. You can't just take out one and say, okay, you know what? Say, yeah. We're going to say this and just mm -hmm. take it out and everything else collapses. Then tomorrow when our dollar gets to 1,200, all of us are asking what happened. It has What's to that? be, it has to, it definitely, it cannot be like, a, oh, this is the thing that's going to solve everything. It definitely needs to be the approach of, you know what, Nigeria is a complicated problem and we have to attack it from... But that's what has happened. Now, so, you, so we've done that. We, he has, we don't even know who the Minister of Finance is going to be. Mm. We don't know who the Minister of Trade is going to be. We don't even have any cabinet technically yet. Mm. And we've done this thing now. So before the cabinet is formed, before they make appointments, before all these nice solutions come, we're looking at another one and a half years. Where do we go from here? Because if prices increase like any further, how is it going to affect individuals? How is it going to affect small businesses? How does it become tenable for us to actually really produce anything, right? Because our incomes are staying largely the same and um, the expenses are increasing like astronomically and it's going to continue um, to have a knock-on effect on other things, whether it's food, whether it's just being able to access um, assess like ba basic necessities. We're here now, right? What I hope that we, we then start to see from this government is some empathy, right? Where I believe in, to be, to be honest, from an economic point of view, I believe in, their po in the policies that they've put out um, so far, and I wish they were happening at a time when we, the Nigerian economy was in a better shape. I worry about how the execution of the policies as is will have an impact on you know, the everyday person. But we're already here. What would I like to see? I'd like to see 
um, government intervention programs that make it credits more accessible to entrepreneurs in different sectors, right? Um, there are big opportunities in entertainment, in Nollywood, in media, right, to be able to do this. Because I feel like one of our biggest um, things right now is Nigerians are the new colonizers. <laughs> we, everyone wants our content, everyone wants our food, everyone wants our music. Those are low hanging fruits. We have a sea of talented individuals in this country. What are we doing to make it more tenable for them to explore those talents, for them to build as in on the industries they've already built? Because um, industries like Nollywood created themselves with no government intervention, with nothing. They literally created themselves and have created exportable products. Meaning we now have international um, streaming platforms that want to buy our content for real money, right? How are we fostering, you know, um, um, industries like that? Not just by making announcements and saying, oh my God, we're giving a $500 million thing to Nollywood and then everyone in Nollywood is looking at themselves and thinking, <laughs> oh, oh, how do we access it? Or they come up with a ridiculous list of things that are not, um, reasonable for the industry that they're saying they're trying to help so what i would like to see is yes make the announcements about um credits interventions or whatever but actually implement them in a way that they actually have an impact implement them in a way where people actually have access to it where the the people who are practitioners in that industry can actually come out and say listen We've benefited from this, um, from this, um, these loans. The, it's true. It's not a myth because the, you're right. The biggest Nigerian problem that we have is a mistrust of our government. If they start to communicate, if they start to do things that, okay, they're saying on one hand, this is um, this is a hard policy that we've put. It's going to fuck up your lives for a while, but in the meantime, we're going to do things that are going to foster um, creation of jobs. We're going to do things that are going to um, foster access to credits. Right? And, and these things are not that hard. The economy and price is going up, but also the insecurity also adds to the stress of living in Nigeria. Yeah. I mean, you can't sure. easily travel by road from Lagos, outside Lagos to certain areas, neither can you travel easily. So I think those are stressors. I think that, uh, like what you're saying, there are certain things that need to be solved very quickly, mm. very quickly to give people the impression that you know, something is there's being movement. done, that there's movement and there's light at the end of the tunnel. Not that we're seeing the light at the tunnel from far back in the tunnel, mm. but that we're seeing the light at the tunnel because we're close to the exit of the tunnel. Mm. Yeah, but I don't know. I'm hopeful for some reason. Like, I'm very scared, but I'm also hopeful because, you know, even just even look at things like, okay, mistake was made about the utterance mm -hmm. about fuel subsidy being and removed and and you know mayhem started and it was just like you know what actually <laughs> let's just <laughs> let's just action in now right but i like the fact that very quickly they were responding we saw prices almost immediately when there was a confusion and um filling stations wanted to arbitrarily start like setting their own um, prices mm -hmm. immediately we see a list of prices across um um, yeah. board of what like the prices will be that as in that will then you know be enforced so i don't know personally things like that make me feel a little bit better in that there's an effort being made to do things whether it is in the right direction or not it makes me feel better than the last government there's an approach that i'm seeing a very stark difference in that yes these policies are mm -hmm hard they have hard um impacts but they are very economic they, they are economic policies that are you can see that the point right is to reduce government intervention the point is to stimulate trade and stimulate um, um productivity those things will not happen immediately from these particular policies but you can't deny that they will have a very, very positive long-term um, impact. But the cocoa of the matter is, guys, please pity us right now. We want to be able to survive. We love our country. We want to be able to do business. We want to be able to create things, goods and services that we can export. Please ameliorate these um, impacts by trying to support that. More important for us to measure results. I think that we, we've been sold a lot of things about policy, but measure results. So the last government, for example, will tell you that it did well because they shared money to X amount of people. 
And for them, that's their metric that's of performance. Right. And that's their metric <laughs> of performance. Whereas um, the ordinary man's metric of performance is how much his 1,000 naira is able to buy, what bundle of goods is able to buy. I think we need to, as a country, as people who are being led by president, agree what the metrics of measuring a president should be. Let's agree that metric. So whoever does well, we give you another four years. Whoever doesn't meet our salary, please show you the door straight up there. So that there's no ambiguity or arguments about if, over whether a president is performing or not. And we're not even lazy people. We like working. We're not lazy. Like when I go to other African countries and I'm just like, bro, you guys have this and this and this and this and it's still so tough for you to, like, to get things done. Nigerians don't have any infrastructure. We literally come out of the gates like solving problems because we have to. We have to. So we're not lazy. We're ready to apply ourselves. We just need a government that makes it, that, that creates an, ena an enabling um, environment. So, so what, what we would expect after, after these um, policy decisions and implementations that have been done is some kind of communication or some kind of empathy. I think, I think that's important. Um, as much as you talk about economics and money in the pocket and all of that, there's also the way people feel, feel about the president, people feel about the country, and that's also important. Because those things tend to affect your identity consciousness, the extent to which you feel that you're Nigerian, or the extent to which you're willing to accept the conditions under which you are. I think that some, you're right, I think that some sentiment or empathy needs to go into there. So thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Um, really looking forward to your feedback. Tell us in the comments what you think the Nigerian government should be doing to ameliorate the negative impacts of their economic policies.